chapter one. Did I do that too quick for you guys back there? I can do a take two. Esther chapter, <laughs> I am so excited to start the book of Esther tonight. We completed the book of Nehemiah last week and we're making our trek through the Bible. I think we started in Genesis in 2006. Uh, spent a lot, that's a big book, right? So we spent, I, I want to say a couple years, then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, then Ezra, then Nehemiah, and tonight's Esther. You know what comes after Esther? Job. So I've scheduled several trials for uh, you to go through while we go through the book of Job. Um, anyway, uh, we need to, uh, why don't we pray first and then we'll uh, get started, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for this book of Esther that we're going to start in tonight. I, I just know, Lord, that you have so much for us in this amazing book. And uh, Lord, I pray that tonight as we tackle chapter one, that you'll speak into our lives and minister to us that which you have for us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's see, I want to give you kind of an introduction, uh, sort of a snapshot of what we're in store for. I know that you know kind of uh, the story of uh, Esther and her uh, uh, cousin Mordechai, and of course the, uh, the demon-possessed Haman, and we're going to be introduced to a lot of these uh, people as we get into it, but uh, Esther is actually a record of what happened to those who remained in Persian captivity. So we're in Ezra and Nehemiah, and it was about those who returned to Jerusalem under uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah as well. But uh, remember, the majority of the uh, Jews stayed in Persian captivity. It was just a small percentage of the Israelites that actually returned to Jerusalem and uh, rebuilt first the wall uh, under Nehemiah and then uh, the uh, temple. Actually, it's the other way around. I was kind of dyslexic, I think. Um, there's 10 chapters in the book of Esther, and I was thinking about this today earlier that, um, you know, uh, I know there's been movies made of Esther. I've seen a couple of them. You know, some of them are okay, but I got to say that Hollywood is missing the boat when it comes to a motion picture uh, true to the biblical account about uh, what happened with Esther uh, there in uh, Persia. It is, to me, one of the most powerful stories of all time. And uh, it's chiefly about uh, Esther, who is uh, a very beautiful Hebrew woman, and uh, how God, in his divine providence, uh, raised her up as a deliverer of God's people. It's interesting because the name Esther means Venus. It's the morning star. And the name, as is always the case in Scripture, the name is the nature. And this is true in the sense that Esther was and became this shining light in a dark period in Israel's history. I thought this was interesting. One commentator noted, Venus, the morning star, sheds its light after all the other stars have ceased to shine and while the sun still delays to rise. So this particular morning star is the only thing that is really shining in between. So he says, thus the deeds of Queen Esther cast a ray of light forward into Israel's history from a dark time and surely she is a light for such a time as this, as it were. Now, the events that are recorded in the book of Esther, it's, it's not chronological when you go through the Bible as we do. It's not uh, in order. Actually, Esther took place between Ezra chapter 6 and chapter 7. So this is actually happening uh, sort of simultaneous with what is recorded for us 
in the book of Ezra. Uh, like the 11 books before it, uh, Esther is a historical book, and it's the 12th and last of the historical books. And if you don't mind, I think this would probably be a good time since we're finishing the historic books to uh, revisit how uh, all 39 books of the Old Testament are arranged in our Bibles. The first five books are known as the Pentateuch. Uh, Pent is where we get uh, words like pentagram or pentagon. It's, it's actually meaning five. And that's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, also known as the uh, books of Moses. The second section are the historical books, which we're going to finish when we finish uh, Esther. It encompasses 12 books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then the last of the historic books is Esther. After Esther, this third division are what are known as the poetic books, consists of five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. I can't wait. If we're still here and we haven't been raptured, I can't wait to get to Psalms and Proverbs. I mean, these are, ah, uh, anyway. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2, Song of Solomon, we're going to have to, it's going to be rated R, so uh, we won't allow anyone 17 or under uh, in you're looking at me like that. I'm, I'm serious. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, book, which makes young people want to read it, I guess. But uh, the fourth and final division are known as the prophetic books. And uh, there's a total of 17 of them. And they're divided into major prophets and minor prophets. The major prophets are five of the 17. They include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the last of the prophetic books are the minor prophets, and there's 12 of them, and they are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Zechariah, and the last book is Malachi. Uh, one more thing before we uh, jump in, uh, very interesting about and unique to the book of Esther, uh, very peculiar, in the entire book of Esther, you will not find one time the word Lord or God mentioned throughout the entire book. And it's the only book of all 66 books of the Bible uh, where this is the case. One has suggested that the book of Solomon, Song of Solomon uh, also doesn't, but depending on the translation, it actually uh, does mention God. Now, uh, as you might Im imagine, <laughs> speculation as to why this is amongst commentators abounds but uh, I have a thought as to why it is, and that is that the absence of the name or the word God or Lord speaks to how it is that God works in our lives even when it seems that he's silent in our lives. And I want to kind of explain that this way. The book of Esther can be summed up with two words, absent the name of God, uh, two words about God, and that's his sovereignty and his providence. And I want to explain a little bit about sovereignty and providence because they're replete throughout this book, even though the direct mention of God is not. Now, the providence and the sovereignty of God is God working behind the scenes in the natural as opposed to God intervening or doing a miracle, which is God doing it in the supernatural. What we're going to see in the book of Esther is God just orchestrating everything in the natural. He's orchestrating all of the circumstances in the natural and everything is for like a lack of a better word, choreographed perfectly according to God's sovereignty. And we're certainly going to see that tonight here as we uh, do chapter one. So verse one, now came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from 
India to Ethiopia. You just need to look at a map and see how vast that is. In those days, verse 2, when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Medea, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed, verse 4, the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of, <coughs> pardon me, his excellent majesty for many days, get this, 180 days in all. That's a lot of splendor. Uh, that's six months. Uh, that's quite a feast, too. That's my kind of feast, <laughs> one that lasts for six months. That's a sabbatical feast. But um, he takes this time to display, pardon me, all the riches of his kingdom, all the splendor of his majesty, and the question has to be asked, why? And the reason he did this, it's believed, is because he wanted to garner the leader's support to wage war against Greece. And the reason being is that Persia had suffered defeat at the hands of Greece and his father, King Darius, uh, never avenged Persia before he died. History tells us that this was an ill-fated and uh, doomed uh, attack and they would suffer a great loss uh, as a result. Verse 5, and when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver. A lot of detail here just to kind of give you an idea of just how majestic this was. It was on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, <laughs> each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king in accordance, verse 8, with the law. Interesting. The drinking was not compulsory. For so the king had ordered all the uh, officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Then verse 9 tells us, Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now this is in a separate location as was the uh, custom of the day. So here we're told about this second feast, lasts for seven days. This is for the citizens of the capital city of Shushan. And right now as we're uh, getting into this, the stage is being set. Uh, you might say that God is up to something, and boy is he, as we're about to see. Now, when it talks about this compulsory, uh, you know, drinking, what that basically meant was, as the tradition was, that every time they had a round or they had a toast, you were required to drink. That <laughs> so this was not the case on this and during this seven-day feast. And th this is a detail which at first glance you're looking at and thinking, why do we need to know this? Oh, very, very interesting reason. Um, they could just drink as much as they wanted, whenever they wanted, and they're about to get very, very intoxicated. So uh, this again is setting the stage for what's about to happen. Now, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbana, Bigtha, Abagtha, uh, forgive my pronunciation on these names, Zathar and Karkas, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, and here's why in order to show her beauty to the people 
and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. Can you just kind of picture this scene here? I mean, we're, we're told this, this goes down on the seventh day. That means they are really, really, <laughs> when it says the king was married with, with wine, that's the New King James uh, translation's way of saying he was really drunk. And so were his men with him. It's been seven days of just drinking and feasting. And can you just kind of imagine, hey, you get a group of guys together uh, with that much alcohol for that long of a period of time. I don't speak from experience. I'm just, uh, you know, <laughs> actually I am from before I came to Christ. But uh, why did I go there? But anyway, I had a little flashback. Just give me a second. Okay, I'm back with you. Um, can you imagine the kind of conversations that are going around the room? And here's the king, you know, they're very drunk, and they're, he's like, hey, I mean, this is full-on pride, and he wants to bring his very beautiful wife, the queen, to kind of show her off before all of these men. Now, verse 12, and this is where things get very interesting. <laughs> But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. All right. Now, um, I want to point out a couple of things here. The first of which is, and you see it there on the screen, um, the first mistake the king made was to make a decision like this, as foolish as it was while being under the influence. And is that not when foolish decisions are made? Decisions that would not have otherwise been made were someone not under the influence. Things are about to take a horrible uh, turn for the worse. Can you imagine how embarrassing and humiliating this would have been to the king. Imagine how uncomfortable it would have been when those eunuchs come back and tell the king, uh, hey king, I'm so sorry, uh, the queen does not want to come and uh, obey your command. How uncomfortable would it be? I don't care how drunk they are. They're like, oh my goodness. What's he going to do? This, by the way, was punishable by death. And oh, by the way, she knows that. Which begs another question. And here again, we have much in the way of speculation as to why it is that she would defy the king knowing that doing so carries with it the death penalty. Now, some believe that she refused because this went against Persian protocol. Others suggest that uh, what he wanted her to do when, he, when she got there was inappropriate. And so she refused not wanting to do that. Uh, one commentator even suggests that uh, she may have been pregnant at the time with the king's uh, son which would explain why she was not just put to death on the spot, which is exactly what could... Keep in mind now, as we're going to see it again, it's another very interesting detail uh, as we get later into the book, uh, when, when Esther says, that, and it calls for a fast, because she's going to approach the king uninvited. And it had been a while before he had summoned her and so she tells Mordecai and all the Jews, we need to pray and fast. And that's when she says, if I perish, I perish. What did she mean by that? Well, what she meant by that was, I'm going to go into the presence of the king uninvited. And if he doesn't put out his scepter, I perish. I'm dead. That's how serious this was. Now, this is kind of on the other end of it. So here, the king does summons her and she refuses to come. Well, that's punishable by death too. So we still have an unanswered question here. Why is it that knowing full well 
that this could be punishable by death. Why does she refuse? Here's why she refused. God put it in her heart to refuse. Again, this is the providence of God. This is the sovereignty of God. I've heard it said this way. I love this. I love this. I love this. God rules over all and overrules all. God over, what do we know to be true throughout scripture? God directs the, the hearts of rulers like the water going downstream. Oh no, <laughs> God put this in her heart. This is the providence of God. This is the sovereignty of God working in the affairs of man to bring about his sovereign end. And if there was ever a case of God doing that, it is with Esther. And this had to happen in order for Esther to ever even come on the scene. This is, again, God orchestrating everything behind the scenes. And he's choreographing every step in his sovereignty. I've heard it said this way, too. God not only directs our steps, he directs our stops. And I really believe that God stopped her from going because as we're about to see, she's going to get deposed in order that God can then raise up Esther for such a time as this. Now, verse 13, and the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Mares, Marsena, and Me Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Medea, who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. So here's the question now that uh, he asks. Verse 15, what shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law? because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs. So I don't know <laughs> if it's possible to overstate how serious of a problem this is now for the king uh, and what's at stake. Uh, and <laughs> not just for the queen, but how about all of these men's wives? You know what they're thinking. In fact, that's what we're about to read here as we get towards the end of the chapter. Uh, but he has just been completely humiliated before all the subjects under his command. And remember now what the reason is for these feasts. He's wanting to garner support to wage war. Now, you've got a king who has a wife, the queen, who is not submitted to his authority? Uh, what about these men now who are going to be submitted to his authority and when they are about to go into battle? Well, let's read on. It's going to get even more interesting. Verse 16, And Memukan <clears throat> answered before the king and the princes, <laughs> Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Azurus. I mean, really? <laughs> They're only thinking about themselves and what are our wives going to say? And they say as much, verse 17, for the queen's behavior will become known to all women, especially our wives so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes. When they report, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. Don't get any ideas. That's not in the original. Verse 18, this very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be, and this is an interesting, interesting way to say it, 
excessive contempt and wrath. Translated, our wives aren't going to obey us anymore because of this king. This is really serious. What are we going to do? Well, perhaps, well, clearly, maybe even rightly, <clears throat> these men are now very concerned about their own wives and really all of the women in the kingdom. Now, as we're going to see next, in seeking to keep their wives in submission to them and respect for them, they're going to get the king to issue a decree. And again, this is an interesting detail that will come into play later because whenever the king would issue a decree, it was irreversible. So this is what Haman would also get him to do very cunningly, very cleverly. And the reason why the king could not reverse this edict uh, is because once he issues it, that's it. And all he could do was arm the uh, Jews with weaponry in order to fight the battle. And then, of course, they would prevail. Why? Because of God's providence and God's sovereignty at work behind the scenes. So they're going to get the king to issue this decree, but <laughs> in all fairness, they might want the right thing, but the problem is they're going about obtaining it in the wrong way, which is what we're going to see them do right now. Verse 19, if it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Azurus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Oh, I know somebody. Verse 20, when the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And, verse 21, of course, the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucam. Then, verse 22, he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province on its own script, and to every people in their own language. <laughs> Get this. That each man should master his own house and speak in the language of his own people. So the chapter ends with this irrevocable decree. All wives will honor their husbands, submit to their husbands who are the masters of the house. Now, again, in all fairness, this is how God ordained it. The husband is to be the head of the home, but we actually have two buts here. The first but is this. Honor and respect cannot be forced. It has to be earned. And we're told how it's earned, especially in the husband and wife relationship in the book of Ephesians, which, by the way, when we're finished with Galatians, and we're in the last chapter of Galatians as well on Sunday mornings, this is the next book, and I cannot wait for this book. I want to end our Bible study tonight uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 through 33. And I want to um, maybe hopefully clear up some things. This, by the way, is uh, in part the passage I use whenever I do a wedding because it holds, and I'm careful when I use this word because it's overused, it's been hijacked. That's another word I probably shouldn't use, but uh, it, <laughs> the word... Um, secret. The secret to the success in marriage is uh, woven into the fabric of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 5. And so if you'll bear with me, I'll uh, begin reading in verse 21. Uh, and by the way, husbands don't like to talk about verse 21. They want to fast forward to verse 22. You know why? Well, listen to what verse 21 says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wait, what? And that he says that first? Yeah. 
In other words, husbands and wives submit one to the other. Then he says, verse 22, every husband has this memorized in several different languages and perfect dialect. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Submit to me, woman. Okay, woman. <laughs> Take them back to verse 21. Oh, uh, wait, I think first though, you're supposed to submit to me and I'm supposed to submit to you. And then he says, verse 22, wives, submit yourselves. And then, uh, by the way, uh, wives, um, he now directs his attention to the husband in verse 23 and says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And then he says again, husbands, not the wife. He only said one thing to the wife after saying both of you need to submit one to another. Wives, submit yourselves to the husband. So now verse 23, husband. Verse 24, husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless in the same way. And this, is, this is why I do this for weddings. Because here's this beautiful bride standing there facing her, you know, groom. And I'm, I'm almost like this, just, you know, to the husband. Husband, love your wife. Husband, I'll get to you in just one second. Husbands, 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 husbands. And in the same way, verse 28 he says it now for the second time. Husbands ought to love their wives. Now the first time he says, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now check out what he says the second time. Husbands, love your wives. Not just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, but love your wives as you love your own body. I have yet to meet a guy that is not, as he walks by that storefront, you know, looking at himself in the reflection you know, sucking it in and puffing it out. And I have yet to meet a guy that's not into his body. And you need to love your wives as your own body. And then he says this, he who loves his wife loves himself. Oh, after all, <laughs> no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And then he says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. Now, I don't know if he caught this or not, but no less than three times he says to the husband, love your wife. Interesting. He does not say to the wife, love your husband. Not even one time. But no less than three times he says to the husband, love your wives. And then, after he says that, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words for the wife. That's it. We just got done reading how many verses to the husband to love your wife. And there's just, he says, and the wife must respect her husband. That's it? What? He just, he just got done, you know, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife. Oh, Ed, and wife, you respect your husband. Just one time. He just says it one time to her. And oh, by the way, um, here's the key. Here's the, again, secret 
for lack of a better word, to a blessed marriage and a successful marriage, and again, I use that word carefully, if a husband will love his wife that way, then the way God's wired the woman, she can't resist respecting her husband. That's the way God wired her. Now, I always like to ask the groom, put him on the spot when I'm doing the wedding. I say, okay, so now that's, a, that's kind of a tall order, isn't it? You got to love her as much as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You got to love her as much as you love and are into your own body. And you got to love her as much as you love yourself. How are you going to do that? I had one uh, recently when <laughs> the groom says, I'm going to love her that way. I just, with all, you know, in love, I just said, no, you're not. You can't. You just can't. There's no way you can, in and of yourself, love her that way. The only way you can love her that way is in the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you and empowering you and enabling you to love her that way. There is no love that you have in and of yourself. I know I've shared this, but this is apropos. You'll bear with me if you've heard it the first 84 times I shared it. But early on in our marriage, I, I remember oh, I was so uh, spiritual, at least I thought. And I remember, I'll never forget this. I remember looking at my wife and I thought it was so profound. I just said to her, honey, I love you with the love that only God can give. And I just thought she was going to melt. Oh, honey, that. But she didn't. Instead, she just, she looked at me with this look of horror. And she says to me, you mean that the only way you can, I'm so unlovable that the only way you can love me is if God gives you a love for me? I'm like, you know how a, a dog looks like this when it's really puzzled? I mean, I'm just going, what? Where did that come from? How do you, how, wives, how do you do that? How do you, listen, us guys, we, we don't get it. There's a lot of things we don't get. And don't do that to us because that really messes us up. I mean, we're trying our best here, okay? So anyway, I, just, I, I tried to, and all of these years later, we, uh, we just celebrated 29 years of marriage last month, and she still reminds me of that. And I've tried for 29 years well, almost to try to qualify it and clarify it, and it's been to no avail, but it's the truth. The only way that husbands can love their wives that way is in the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling them. That's the only way. Now, <clears throat> I have yet to meet a guy that doesn't want his wife to respect him. Uh, I'll even venture to say that he wants more than anything, that's how God wired him, he wants more than anything to be respected. Interesting, not loved. I, I, I don't want to, you know, um, make anybody uncomfortable, but I'm, I'm pretty sure guys aren't going to their wives and going, do you love me? <laughs> pretty sure that doesn't happen. I mean, as a rule, right? But conversely, the guy is going to always say to, and even in some cases, wrongly demand from the wife this respect and submission. One of the things I'm learning, I never like to say, I've, especially when it comes to marriage, and I'll, I'll save the marriage teaching for when we get to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, but um, one of the things I'm learning, and I don't say learned, especially in the context of marriage, uh, I'm still learning. Uh, what I'm still learning is, is that um, when I love my wife this way, then she'll respect me in the way that God made her to respect me. And she wants to, by the way. She wants to. 
She wants to respect me and she wants to, uh, as my wife, have that covering over her. She wants to know that she is so loved and the most important person than, and the most important thing to me than anything else in my life next to the Lord. And when she's that secure and she knows she's that loved, then she will in turn respect me in the way that God made her to. And that's the secret to a successful marriage. It, it sounds simple, doesn't it? But the buck stops with the man. It's, it's not incumbent upon the woman to respect the man. You know, so in other words, the, the man's saying, well, I'm not going to love you till you respect me. It doesn't work that way. She can't respect you until and unless you love her that way. And proportionate to how you love her, she'll respect you. Proportionate to how you love her as a husband, she will in turn, proportionate to that, respect you. Respect is earned. Respect is earned. And that's how I want to end the Bible study. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this chapter again here in your word. And Lord, we're just really excited for what's in store for us as we study through the book of Esther. And we're really excited to meet Esther and Mordecai and, and uh, just see your mighty hand at work as you just do exactly what you purpose and plan to do in the deliverance of your people in such a magnificent and mighty way. Lord, thank you so much. For anyone here tonight that maybe has been struggling with the situation in your life, maybe the takeaway is this. God rules over all and overrules all. Nothing happens unless God ordains it and orchestrates it. And he is orchestrating it for his glory and your good. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.